This is Stuart Patrick. Welcome to The Internationalist. Today we're delighted to be joined by the director of Chatham House in Britain, Robin Niblett. We're going to be discussing the future of NATO in the wake of the experiences that the alliance has had for the past 10 years in Afghanistan and more recently in Libya. Robin, it's great to have you on the program. Thanks, Stuart. Um, looking back over the past decade plus, what are the main lessons that you draw about the capabilities of the NATO alliance uh, to actually conduct counterinsurgency and uh, stability operations out of area, and also about the appetite of European publics to engage in these uh, sorts of ventures? I think the conclusion has to be mixed uh, if you talk about NATO as an alliance. Uh, the United States has had to take the lion's share, whether in Afghanistan, uh, whether in Iraq, and even in Libya, um, in the current operation, even though the U.S. was less actively involved and sought to get the Europeans to play a much more active role, it still ended up having to be the main provider of uh, intelligence, reconnaissance, refueling, command and control. Um, so when one talks about NATO as an alliance that sought to adapt itself after the end of the Cold War to be able to play a, a role that's beyond the Euro-Atlantic space, that's looking at uh, conflicts that take place now in the Middle East or in South Asia, um, it's finding it difficult to make that transition. Part of the problem, uh, to get to the second part of your question, is, as you said, the European appetite. Europe is made up of many countries, um, all of which have a different view of what they want out of the alliance. There are some, like the UK, that are open mm -hmm. to having a more global role for NATO. Mm -hmm. But there are many others, especially those that joined in Central Eastern Europe, um, who still see themselves joining principally for the famous Article 5 that will protect them from what they still see as a rather bearish uh, Russia um, and who are very much focused on getting U.S. protection for their own internal uh, security uh, and, and domestic security. So you have mixed, mixed views. So if um, the experience of Afghanistan has not been an entirely happy one for, for the alliance and there's obviously a, a move to have ISAF troops um, be um, leaving Afghanistan. Um, Yet there seemed to be sort of a renaissance uh, in, in NATO's continued utility uh, with um, the campaign against uh, Muammar Gaddafi and uh, his eventual um, deposition in, um, in, in Libya. Did that give a, a second win? Did it prove uh, NATO's continued vitality? Uh, and did it also point out some of the shortcomings um, that we've been discussing? I mean, a bit of both, in the sense that you could say from a military standpoint, certainly it was a successful operation. Mm -hmm. Um, and NATO assets, not just national assets, were used. Uh, and uh, this was an operation in which the U.S. did not have to lead and play the, the, the dominant role the way that it did um, in Afghanistan as it did in, in, in Iraq. It was less of a NATO operation, but one that involved NATO assets. Um, but at the same time, it precisely uh, delineated those deficiencies in terms of European countries' capabilities to operate uh, internationally. Uh, the UK um, found it was running short of precision-guided munitions. Uh, the uh, European allies that took a lot of the lead on the bombing runs had to rely on U.S. capacity for identifying targets, for doing bomb damage assessment afterwards. Um, the command and control that's required to have multiple planes from different nationalities all flying around the same airspace, the ability to do sorties in a coordinated way. This is really complicated stuff, which the Americans have had the advantage of operating quite actively through their much more uh, dominant roles in Afghanistan and Iraq, which European countries are, are less accustomed to doing. So it did show some of the deficiencies, as well as political ones. Right. So remember, we had many allies who, who chose the not, Germans, not, chose uh, amongst others, who chose not to take part at all. Right. I think it, one of the challenges for NATO going forward is, is what can European countries offer right. if they can't all offer things individually? Mm -hmm. And people are talking these days about sort of pooling capacities more right. and sharing uh, uh, resources. And did, does this relate to the debate within Europe itself about what sort of defense capabilities a united Europe should have and, and also Europe's, the EU's, in a sense, power projection capabilities? Absolutely. I mean, I think this is, it, it did remind uh, members of, of, of NATO, European members of NATO, of their limits of their, of their capacity. And they've come up with this new term, at least in NATO command, called smart defense. 
Smart, we've had smart sanctions, right. smart power, smart now we've got power, smart, defense. smart defense. If you, right. you put smart in front, it's going right. to be smart. <laughs> uh, but basically, it's a way of repackaging this concept that European countries that are now, on average, spending 1.6% of GDP on defense. Much lower than the United States. Much lower, which is around 4% of GDP. Right, Even exactly. the UK is approaching 2%. Mm -hmm. And you know, one of the highest percentage of GDP spenders is Greece. <laughs> uh, which is not for now, for, right. for now and uh, that'll probably cut back, but maybe they'll try and cut other things first. Uh, but what it's reminded people of is there's a lot of duplication. Mm -hmm. Uh, there's still a lot of Cold War mentality in terms of the structures uh, that are being used there. And what there's not been is the thinking of how do we how do we share, how do we pool assets, maybe in training, in logistics, uh, in various support functions. Uh, maybe particular countries lead on electronic countermeasures. Other countries might lead on strike capacity. Shouldn't there be the ability within a Europe that shares pretty much the same security threats around it to pool? and therefore get a better return on, on the investment. Well, I don't know if this is going to play out because in the end, if you look at Libya, not everyone wanted to be committed. Mm -hmm. So do you want to rely on a country that maybe says, well, you know what, maybe we won't supply you with those particular Even relations. though we have those assets. Even though we have those assets. So, so NATO is having its summit in um, Chicago um, this May and uh, has been developing its new strategic concept and, and, uh, and working that through. Do you see NATO's profile as being in, of increasing utility in dealing with the threats of the 21st century, and one thinks of things like cyber war or energy security, as a, as well as sort of non-traditional threats like terrorism. Do you see NATO as increasing or declining as importance as sort of a global exporter of security, if you will? Well, I mean, everything's relative. For all of the criticism one can make of NATO post Cold War, and I, I've I've just been making some of that criticism myself. What do you measure it against? Right. What are the other great alliances out there, military alliances, that are projecting security either in their own region or even with the capacity, as they did after the Pakistan earthquakes and so on, to actually project uh, or, or with power the or humanitarian pirates, or right? the Somali pirates? You know, Europe and America working together have some of the most sophisticated military assets. Mm -hmm. They do share the capacity to coordinate politically. They may disagree a lot and argue, but in the end, when they do want to act together, they can. Uh, you'd probably want to reinvent NATO if you didn't have it. Uh, and no one wants to lose that insurance capacity or that ability to bring together those who are willing and able within NATO to actually operate together. So I think NATO has a future. And what they'll be talking about, I think, at the, at the NATO summit is smart defense. What does it really mean? Mm -hmm. um, what do we do about missile defense? A very important, perhaps right. new area of, of investment uh, for the EU as a whole. And how do you strike up international partnerships without enlarging? Uh, the UAE, uh, Qatar have been involved in the Libya operation. Yeah, Japan is quite interested in having some type of relationship sure. uh, with NATO. So I think NATO definitely has a future. It's probably going to continue to be quite fractious with declining budgets and very differing views of security. But I, I think we're going to have plenty more summits to talk about. Well, it, this has uh, been a wonderful beginning to that conversation. I hope we have other uh, chances to talk about NATO and, and its future. I want to thank uh, Robin Niblett for uh, joining us. You can join us uh, online uh, at CFR.org on the Internationalist blog, and we encourage you to join the conversation. Thanks very much.